We're going to get rolling. Welcome, folks. Nice to see everybody here. Nice to see some unfamiliar names in the list. I see some familiar names in the list of participants as well. Super happy to be here. Pavani, how are you? I can't hear you. I don't know what's going on. You're muted. I am doing wonderfully well. And how are you today, Jeff? I'm great. I'm great. It's the end of my day, and I, I'm, I've been excited about this uh, this webinar for a while. And we've got a good group of folks here, which is uh, which is fantastic. So I'm super excited to be here um, and uh, working with Pavani in this. Pavani Pavani's um, one of our authors at Sense and Respond Press, and she's got a book coming out imminently now called Ethical Product Development. Um, and she's gonna we're gonna. Uh, actually, I, I love the concept for this webinar because um, so often we do this kind of back and forth as a presentation and Q&A and discussion with the author, which is great, but we've got a really nice interactive component here today. Um, Pavani's put together a game for us to play. Um, who, who knew ethical product development could be put into, into a game format, which is great. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Pavani before we get started. She's worked in product development across the last couple of decades. Uh, she studied economics at Brown and business and law at University of Virginia. I spent a lot of time at University of Virginia, but not as a student. <laughs> I had a lot of good times there, though. Uh, she, cur cur she currently leads a product management and user experience design team in her time outside of work. Um, she's written this book, which is amazing, which we're super uh, proud about it. And so, Pavani, as, as, as we get started with this, um, why, why write a book? Why write this book? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Jeff. Um, so I wrote this book on ethical product development because probably like many folks on this call, I love what we do and I'm constantly reading about how to do different aspects of, of it better. And I'm constantly thinking about what quality actually means. And in the last year or so, I've been really um, working through an agile transformation as part of my core job um, and recognize that we have in our fields all sorts of resources for improvement around process. Um, so processes to do a better brainstorming session, um, processes to do better quality assurance testing. But I noticed a gap. Um, there's an absence of guidance I believe, on how to incorporate ethical decision-making through the product development process end-to-end. -end. And that's really the playbook that I was looking for. So in my forays, I decided to write, you know, essentially what I think is the first draft of a playbook um, and really put it out there for people to see if they can incorporate the different elements um, that are true to the core product development process, but do so in a way that incorporates ethical decision-making. Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, um, I've been doing a lot of work lately with a with a client, and and playbooks is a part of that process. And and once you start to kind of lay all that out, and and I've worked with other folks as well who've built these playbooks. You're like, wait a minute, this is, I need I need. There's much broader application for this, which is which is great to hear that you're sharing this more broadly. So look, ethics ethics is a broad broad spectrum of of. Um, uh, stuff. <laughs> I don't have a better mm -hmm. word at the moment. So give, give us some, what are some examples of, of the types of ethical questions that people who develop products and specifically in our case, digital products, right? What are the types of ethical questions that they may encounter or challenges they may encounter as we go through this, as they go through war yeah. situations? Yeah, I, absolutely. I'm, Jeff, it is a broad category of stuff. I think that's a good word. Um, and there's so many examples um, just on, on the question of, for example, um, how, do you, how do you handle uh, people's personal information when they interact with your company and your products? Um, even on that one seemingly narrow question, there's several ethical questions like, how should you use their data to nudge future behavior? or uh, nudge them to take certain actions? Um, should you feed their data into machine learning tools? Um, you know, how you should uh, get their consent when you're using data. Um, those are just a few examples, but we're bombarded, as you know, with so much stuff and with so many ethical questions and, and, and they're infinite, um, which is 
part of the the thesis of the book, which is that we have to have a process to handle those kind of that is in a way that is core to the product development process. Got it. I want to just um, also, you know, we as as folks are joining the Zoom and we're using the Zoom software, I, you know, just to just to put it into kind of a current reality, I uh, want to just explore the example of Zoom for a moment because I think we've all sort of seen a product that we're really familiar with grapple with um, ethical questions. And so um, I was I was personally had, I personally have the privilege of being part of a early beta team for Zoom in uh, 2013. And so when they were a very small company um, putting out their initial um, video conferencing software, I took part in several conference calls with the Zoom team, um, including their CEO, Eric Yan. And I remember the process being so fun. Um, I was, it was a little earlier in my career, and I was uh, just really impressed by the passion that this team had and the speed at which they were putting out, you know, updates to the software and taking in our feedback. And, you know, kind of fast forward the clock seven years later, we're all here now. Um, but as you know, um, the, the Zoom usage has grown astronomically as we're all, you know, contending with physical distancing because of the coronavirus. And at the end of March, Zoom um, ran into a lot of trouble um, in, its, in the early days of, you know, when a lot of consumers were using Zoom because they hadn't set up a lot of the privacy and security features um, that this new set of use cases and scenarios really demanded. And, you know, they, they had a default where pretty much anybody with um, a, a Zoom link could enter a Zoom meeting um, pretty easily. And, you know, this, this caused a lot of problems. They had, um, you know, Zoom bombing, Zoom bombing became a thing. Um, they accidentally it sent... I, I, Oh, you did. I, I have been Zoom bombed. Yeah, it was um, super strange. I was on, I was on a, uh, I was doing a presentation to an, an agile group in Cairo in Egypt and the host tweeted out the link 10 minutes, the public link 10 minutes before we, we started. And as I was giving my presentation, first five minutes, there was a, a gentleman, a gentleman is, an, is a, uh, probably an exaggeration <laughs> based on- A bad that. actor. <laughs> yeah, a bad, a bad actor who came on and um, immediately started taking his clothes off. Um, with, and it was one of those like, you know, with like a Brady Bunch view with 49 different little screens on there. And he was just, and, and, and the host was so flustered. He'd never, he, he didn't know how to kick anybody out of Zoom. We, we were like frantically like pushing buttons to get him out. So we, we've, I've experienced this firsthand. Yeah, and it's, and it's really jarring. And I think um, we probably wouldn't have even thought of that scenario. I, I'm, I'm certain in 2013, um, not many of us were thinking about those scenarios. And, you know, Zoom, Zoom had this opportunity. Um, you know, they, they had a really golden moment to, you know, push out competitors and really, um, you know, and, and they have experienced a wonderful trajectory. Um, but that being said, you know, they had, you know, this was a pretty spotty period for them. A lot of large companies kind of took a, you know, took a pause from Zoom um, and they ended up having to do a three month new feature freeze um, and address a, a lot of these concerns, but a lot of damage had been done. And I give the Zoom team huge amount of credit for how they responded. Um, but Eric Yan himself responded, you know, very elo eloquently and elegantly, you know, through the, through this, um, period of time, but said that they had fallen short of their own standards um, and the community's expectations around privacy. And he acknowledged that they, you know, that the Zoom team just wasn't really thinking about the risks and thinking about, um, you know, the ethics of this in a comprehensive way. So, you know, Zoom is, is just an illustration of, of the point of this book that, you know, good people make a lot of choices in an unconscious way and they end up in situations that can be um, fairly damaging. And so their team is really relatable, um, you know, to a lot of us, to the practitioners that are doing this work. Yeah, no, I mean, look, as a UX, as a, as a UX designer myself, or at least a reformed one, uh, there is, you know, you, you always think about the happy path, right? You're designing the happy path, right? This is how the overwhelming majority of the folks are going to use this. And, 
and why would they use it any other way, right? Especially in a, in a malicious way or, or in, in, a, in a way that, that could potentially uh, hurt or endanger some other folks. And so, yeah, we tend not to think about that. And so, so that gets me kind of to my next question and before we get started with the game. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, I've been a UX designer, product manager, et cetera. Um, who's the audience for, for ethics, for, for product ethics, for ethical product development, and, and not, not just the book, but for the, the work itself, who is the, who is the audience? Yeah, um, you know, my audience includes, because I'm handling the, the, um, the topic on a process level that is fairly end to end, I believe that the audience is all the roles that are involved in product development. So it can range from entrepreneurs to product managers to user experience designers to actually the data scientists, the software engineers, and then other roles um, related to kind of the product positioning and product marketing um, angles and even even sales um, and customer support and customer success. So. And, and, you know, there's a, there's a couple of roles, too, that I mentioned um, in the book, but um, product lawyers, I think, are, you know, play an important um, part in this process. And I'd love to, Jeff, understand, um, I, I see a lot of chats, and I'd love, love to learn who my audience is today before we get into the game show. Um, and I, I think we are set up to poll them to see yeah. how they identify themselves. All right. Tell us what you do. Who's attending? Um, what's your role here? And there's a bunch of options there. Yeah, and I think you can do multiple choice, which is often hard um, in our field uh, because typically, so I do product management and user experience, and there's just a lot of overlapping boxes here. Yeah. So far, no lawyers commenting. Sorry. <laughs> And I'm a non-practicing one. I see. Um, <laughs> Do you always have to qualify it that way? I think so. I think so because um, <laughs> just a little safer to do that. Right. Okay. We got we have 21 out of our 24 attendees have voted so far. I'll give it like six more seconds and then. Uh, and then we'll end the poll and see, uh, I'll share the results and show you who we have. So it's, um, it's a good mix of folks though, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna end the poll, let's share the results here. So this is, uh, this is who we have in the room. Product managers seem to be sort of the overwhelming and then UX and other. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the other. There's quite a quite a few who have identified identified as such. I wonder if they can chat in or if anyone wants to say. Yeah, in, in the chat, what if you put other? What are you? If if you're in the chat, uh, Johanna says you know he's a you he's a UX unicorn, <laughs> which wasn't in the poll. <laughs> that's the one. That's the option that I we left off of this, Jeff. <laughs> Uh, we, so we've got uh, director of UX, we've got coach, agile coach, a couple agile coaches. Um, yeah, agile folks, PO, Excellent. Um, design consult, scrum master, tech writer. Um, yeah, looks like coaches is where it's at. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Great. Awesome. And so um, look, product development, there's so much stuff that goes into product development already. And there's so many, you know, and I'm certainly guilty of, of contributing to this as well. Um, so many new things we have to think about as we think about the best way to, de to develop products. E e ethics isn't optional, right? I, I, it's, not, it's not optional, right? So how do we incorporate ethical decision-making into the product development process? Yeah, and um, so this is, if you're looking at this screen here, um, this is the cover of the book, but I did want to highlight that this is about practical techniques to apply across the product development life cycle. And to your point, um, you know, Jeff, there's so much entailed in the product development process itself. But what I do um, in the book is it's laid out in five chapters, and these are um, lenses um, that I 
know to be crucial in terms of incorporating ethical decision making. And so I'm going to go through those five right now just to give people a bit of a framework so that they um, know where I'm coming from in terms of the practical techniques that are offered in the book. So the first one is um, to articulate your aspirations with the product code of ethics. And this is sort of the idea of establishing a North Star and establishing that North Star in an aspirational way. So um, this is crucial to set those principles um, with your team and give you guys a, like a set of guidelines to help you make those ethical decisions. The second one is actually um, a practical kind of companion to that first one, which is to bring those to life by actually establishing principal champions. And you can do this in informal and formal ways, but to make sure that those aspirations that are in the product code of ethics don't just end up sitting on a shelf, but that there's people in an everyday sense um, helping to incorporate this in the process. Um, the third piece, um, which I think is also an imperative, is to identify the ethical shortcomings of the product today. So in this field of ethical product development, the reality is we're going to be judged by the shortfalls, the lowest points of our product, because it sort of doesn't matter what you say you want to do or what the, you know, the North Star, the aspiration is. It's actually the history of ethical choices that, you know, the product team, the company has made already. And so chapter three is about, you know, really laying out some processes to audit the product and understand where you are so that you can start raising the floor. Um, and then the fourth one is where the major half the techniques in the book are in this, you know, one set of end to end um, process elements. So this is about baking ethics into the product development process itself. So I think you alluded to this. I've been sort of trying to say this as well is that it can't be a separate ethics process. It can't be an optional thing that you do at the end. Um, it can't be something that just one person does. Um, and so this is about kind of going from all the way to discovering the problem that you're solving to how do you monitor the solution to that problem once it's out in the market. And so there's a, a 10 techniques here in terms of using, um, using specific practices to bake ethics into the product development process. And then the last one um, is, you know, what I'm finding that people talk about the most um, these days, which is being able to stay personally committed to ethical product development. So, you know, this idea of, you know, each of us are working on teams and the first four are really about working with teams. But the fifth one is about establishing one's own personal career code of ethics and then really finding opportunities to stay committed and stay inspired about that um, through the, through this very, challenging work of producing ethical products with a with high social value and impact. So that's a rough idea of how the book is um, structured and there's uh, 20 techniques across these five chapters. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, and, and I recommend you all go get the book now. All right, let's get into it. Let's get into this game. So you, you made a game. Uh, around ethical product development, which I'm impressed, right? I'm not sure it was the first thing I would have gone to uh, to teach this, but hey, whatever, whatever works, and it sounds amazing. So, uh, tell us how the game works, and then we'll just, we'll just jump into it because I think folks are here are here for that. So let's let's get that going. Absolutely. Um, so this game is called Ethical Crossroads, um, and just a caveat that it's in no way meant to make light of you know these harms and potential harms of products, but what I'd love um, the group of us that are here today is to imagine that we're part of a product development team that has built a thing. And so I'm going to show you, I'm going to go over to the game board now. This is, looks a lot like the Jeopardy game board, and it is about some ethical Jeopardy. And what I would love for us to imagine is that we are a team. Um, so there's a bunch of product managers, a bunch of user experience designers, um, lots of representation from all of those different roles, um, including agile coaches and um, including technical writers and, and so forth. So I'd love to bring your lens of how you do your work into this game. 
And we're going to go through as many scenarios as we can. We think at least a half dozen or more, but we'd love for you to tell us what's interesting to you and where to go. Um, but I'd like you to imagine that you are um, part of the team that is, is producing this solution. And it's, it's meant to solve a problem in the world. And we're, we have a poll question. And then we can, if you can, once you answer the poll question, um, if you can start chatting or start uh, in, the, in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and we'd love to get a discussion going about why you chose um, the, the answer that you chose. So would love to jump right into it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, then, and just a couple, a couple of logistical thoughts. So we'd love to hear from you as well. Typically in these, uh, in these webinars, you know, you're, you're a spectator and, and like speaking is, is either forbidden or, or just simply not enabled. Um, so it, we're going to ask you to put, put some feedback in the chat as to why you answered the way you did. But if you'd like to, if you'd like to speak to, or, or you know, to either talk about um, the challenge or why you answer the way you did or to ask a clarifying question or whatever it is, um, there's a way for you to raise your hand in the panel in Zoom. You can, you can raise your hand. Um, uh, and then if you raise your hand, I can then um, click a button here in the control panel that allows you to talk, which is a very powerful phrase. Uh, it says allow to talk. And then I'll, I'm happy to let you um, speak uh, directly to, to, to Pavani and get the questions going. So let, let's just try one of these and we'll get going. Let's do with, let's go with underserving people for 300, Pavani. <laughs> let's go with that. Uh, all right, you got it. So this one is grocery store website. It's not accessible to visually impaired people. Let's go ahead and run the poll, Jeff, so that people can see what their what their options are. Got it. Okay. And remember, and try to envision that we are a team that that discovered that our site is not accessible. Okay, so we're getting some votes in there. About half the folks have voted so far. Can okay, 15 of 22 votes going? If you have any clarifying questions, you can type them in the chat. Um, Okay, about a minute into voting, we get 17 out of 22 voters. About three, three quarters of the folks have voted. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. These are the results that we got, Pavane. Yeah, I see that. So, um, so there's obviously a clear majority in, um, into the second choice, which is no, let's improve it in a specific way and then roll it out. And then, um, and then, uh, few folks on either of those other choices, but the no, let's pivot away from this approach entirely. I'd love to hear um, from folks, anybody who raises their hand would love to hear um, you vocalize why you voted um, either in any of these um, choices. Yeah, if you just raise your hand in the Zoom panel, I can unmute you and uh, let you describe the reason why you, you voted. Okay, here we go, Johannes. All right, Johannes, you're up. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah. I, I voted for the third one. Uh, so completely uh, get away from the approach. Uh, so entirely because I think it's um, about inclusion and not making it more accessible. So uh, just uh, putting another crutch in it is uh, just uh, like, yeah, helping people getting around the problem that should not be there in the first place. So that's the reason mm -hmm. why I would uh, go away from this solution. Mm -hmm. And for um, anyone who, and, and to, to me, the, the difference between the second and the third choices are, you know, how, how dramatically 
um, you believe that we as a team need to adjust what we're doing. Um, and so I'd love to hear from folks who uh, maybe also voted there or voted in the other categories about, you know, what you think the fix should be. Who else? Just raise your Any hand. Any other chat coming in? Let's see. If you voted for a different option, why did you vote for that option? Anyone? We're a small enough group. And also we're, no, we're, we're um, because we're all on the same team and we developed this together, no judgment on right. the folks that, who have said, yes, this is fine as is, as is, or that there's a specific way in which they, they wish to improve this. Would love to hear the, those ideas as well. Okay, all right, Kenneth wants to speak. All right, I want Kenneth in there. Hey, Kenneth. Hi there. How are we doing? Hi. Nice to see you. Yeah, likewise, mate. Um, so I'm going to be judgmental, even if you can't. Anyone who said that this is fine um, is is wrong, just out and out wrong. You're going to get sued for a start. It's illegal in many jurisdictions, if not most. Uh, jurisdictions to consciously release technology that is inaccessible to a bunch of people. So the 12% or whatever who've said that this is fine are going to find themselves, uh, you know, being sued for many millions of dollars. Um, for me, also accessibility is a moral issue. It's not just about am I, uh, you know, making products accessible to people. It's it's really about who am I treating, who am I deeming worthy of being called a human. You know, we've, we're meant to be human-centered designers for all the potential flaws in that phrase. And if you intentionally exclude people from your products of your work, then you are essentially saying that I do not deem this person to be human. So there's a huge sort of social justice, uh, social justice issue at play as well here. So forgive me for being so sort of hard and fast, but anyone who's voted in uh, category A here, I, I'm going to disagree with them quite strongly. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you for, um, you know, presenting that perspective. And I think this is, um, you know, to get to the punchline, and I'd love to go through a ton more scenarios in this, um, in this webinar, but to get to the punchline, these are the kinds of conversations that it would be my dream for more product development teams to have in the context of their, of their work together as a team. Because clearly we, we don't all land in the same place. These um, issues are tough, very nuanced. Um, and of course, you know, as you mentioned, there is a legal aspect to it, which is, you know, different in different jurisdictions and so forth. Um, and so these are the types of conversations that I hope that folks who pick up are able to pick up the book or even without the book can inspire in their, in their teams and be able to get to a resolution where they are um, evolving the way that in which they're uh, producing the product. So Jeff, I'd love to go um, elsewhere and um, look at another scenario and, you know, folks who are interested in certain topics, um, please feel free to uh, chat in or, or jump into what other... Well, I'm going I'm to put, um, put Kenneth on the spot because he's already unmuted. And, um, and he, uh, so I'll let Kenneth choose the next category since he's unmuted. And then I'll... Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm doing a lot of privacy design work at the moment, so maybe privacy, compromising privacy for 400. Okay. Oh, this one's ripped from the headlines. By the way, all 25 of these are real teams and companies. Okay. GeoAware wristband syncs with symptom checking apps and fever screening cameras for use at workplace. I'll launch the poll. Let's see, poll number two. What would you do? And again, if you have any clarifying questions, either raise your hand or just type them in the chat.
this is really ripped from the headlines. <laughs> mm -hmm. Half the folks have voted so far. Let's see how we're doing. Take maybe 10 more seconds to get your vote in there. Um, what would you do about this? You're the team. Again, about 70% of the folks in the call have voted. All right. All right. I'm going to end the poll. This is where we net it out. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it looks, um, so you can see um, that there's a lot of different perspectives here. Um, I would love to go through, I mean, folks who have strong opinions um, or even what, or even a weaker opinion and just were, tell me your thought process in, in terms of why you chose as you chose. And I think it helps really to envision that we are a team that is trying to solve the underlying problem. Um, because I think that leads us to sort of a discussion of what is, what is the, the best way. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? Raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Dan. All right. Dan. Hey, thanks hey. for hosting this. Yep. Um, so just in terms of a, a thought process, um, I, I like to ask and, and collaborate with team members on if they'd be comfortable using this technology themselves. And um, there mm. is an immediate gut feeling reaction of, no, I would not be comfortable with this. Um, I think that, you know, the, the area of workers' rights in America, uh, specifically, I'm, I'm not too sure about other countries, but um, is, is definitely geared more towards the employer. Um, and so thinking of cases like Amazon and Walmart, um, where they'll be tracking and um, asking uh, employees to give up a lot or telling employees to give up a lot more information about themselves than they'd uh, prefer. Um, but then in the context of, of COVID, uh, this is all coming up again and we're seeing a lot of this. So I think the, the pivot away from wristbands in particular is very different than um, just symptom checking apps and fever screening cameras uh, at particular places in a business. So um, I think mm -hmm. this, those two things kind of stood out to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's interesting as kind of a micro technique, which is, um, and it, I'm curious, Dan, what is your specialty or discipline in, in the product development process? Are you in user experience design? Uh, product management. Product management. I think, I think the micro technique that you raised is a really interesting one, which is, do we feel like, would we use this? What would we drink our own champagne, if you will? And to what extent? Um, dog fooding, I guess, is another way to say that. But is this, is this something that we want? Um, and, and that's kind of a good way to get at having a conversation with each other about the manner in which to um, pursue this, the solution to this problem. We'd love to hear other thoughts. There are, so there are a couple in the chat. Who, there's one, there's one from, from Kenneth, with it, which I think is worth bringing up. So um, uh, I'm gonna let, um, give, give Kenneth the opportunity to talk again. And Johannes has a good question too. So, um, but Kenneth, Kenneth, go ahead with your feedback because it's good. Yeah, this one, this one I find tricky. I actually said this was okay, but that there's a whole bunch of it depends, but go with it. Uh, the PGA Tour Golf, um, they're all operating in a bubble and they actually had a player withdraw because he was wearing a smart ring that diagnosed symptoms or alerted him to possible symptoms while he was asymptomatic. So, I mean, there is a potential upside for this, that if you do reduce COVID infections and ultimately death, that's pretty good from an ethical point of view, right? So we shouldn't underestimate the potential value if, if this technology works. But for me, it, uh, 
particularly because we're focusing on privacy here, I'd want to know what jurisdiction this is in. If it's in the EU, I'm much more comfortable with it. If it's in the US, particularly outside of Washington or California, um, then I'm much more concerned. If it's in China, I'm already more concerned. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the legality comes into it a little bit, but it's this, this one I think is a really complex one, much less clear cut than, than the previous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, so the jurisdiction matters from, you know, what is actually required as a, you know, as a legal minimum. And then, then when you layer onto that, you know, the, the underlying value system. Um, and I think Dan brought this up in his comment too, that if you feel that the sort of the, the rights or the power, the balance of power is a little bit more with the employers than the employees, um, then that may also contribute to how you might answer this question. Um, so it is, it, it can be a very localized um, type of discussion, but yeah, thank you for that. Awesome. If there's no other comments on this one, I would actually love to take the group to another one. Um, were, were there other comments? Um, there, there was a, there was a question from, your, from Johannes where he asked if the geotag is relevant for contact tracing. Yeah, and, and that's, that's actually a good question. I mean, so there's so much innovation happening, but um, from, and so some of these are, you know, these, this one obviously is ripped from the headlines. And so com some companies are approaching it um, in, in a way that um, is trying to make sense of the geotagging um, in, in order to look at somebody's footprint of exposure and so forth. And others are pursuing it in, in different ways. Um, so this is this is really complex. I'm curious if if that that in it, in and of itself makes you sort of think about the nuance of this differently. Like, is it better or worse in your mind for that to be a critical element of it? Hmm. In other words, Johan, is that like? Does it does it make you did you bring that up because you think it's you know it's more or less acceptable? Right, like Dan 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 says, does does outcomes define ethics? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, and he's saying that yeah, there are solutions out there without the geotag that store only the contact anonymously. And so so that's, you know, c collecting quite a bit less information or personally identifiable information. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, it depends on which ethicist <laughs> that you ask and also which ethical lens. Yeah, and, and Dan does outcome define ethics. So is it, you know, so that's the harm, you know, the, the good social good versus the harm, right? You know, there's, there's a lot of different vectors by which to evaluate these. And that's actually one of the techniques in the book is to give the lay person, you know, not somebody who studied philosophy or ethics, you know, a few of the core um, weight dimensions um, to evaluate some of these decisions. What's going to be incredibly important um, there, too, is to have a, a set of guiding principles to understand really, you know, which um, of the, you know, which ethicist sort of underlying value system is the one that is going to be applied for that particular team. Don't ask, just don't ask Katie on the good place. Yes, I love that. I love that because for those of you who are familiar with this television show, The Good Place, um, this, uh, this is a hilarious um, sitcom. Uh, and there is a character named Chidi who talks about ethics um, and lovable, extremely lovable character. But, you know, first of all, it's deathly boring, which was really my impetus for creating this kind of game because probably nobody would want to sit here and listen to me talk for an hour about ethics. Um, but that being said, it, I think that his short, his shortcoming Chidi in the good place is that he has a really hard time applying the, the principles to actual decisions. Um, and so this book is actually a little bit about that, which is, you know, we can, 
you know, have a lot of thoughts on this, but really it's in our actions that, you know, the, the ethics or the harmful consequences are going to be either avoided or played out, um, depending on what we choose. I'd love to take us over to the um, to the one that I think is kind of a based on the discussion we just had. I'd love to hear folks' thoughts on this one. Okay. Um, this was in my unintended consequences potpourri bucket um, for 500, and I found in previous rounds of playing this game that this one was extremely hard for people. While people are voting, Pavani, you got a, a big vote of confidence from Melissa. She said that she would happily listen to you talk for an hour about ethics. <laughs> K-12, kindergarten to 12th grade. So uh, like the entire school uh, school years before university. All right. So AI predicts risks of gun violence and self-harm from kindergarten to 12th grade students writing samples, including social media. Hard split on this one yeah. so far with Pretty much an even split. I'm seeing that. Yeah, it's sixty percent of the votes in so far. There we go. So, folks, this is a real company um, in the United States. It's called Gaggle. Um, it serves about five million students, uh, public school, most of which are public school students across the country. Um, they, you know, they are minors, of course, um, meaning they're under, you know, they're under 18 typically. Um, and if they are using their school email address with any of these other social media platforms, that opens up the opportunity for Gaggle to evaluate their writing and postings on those media as well. Wow. So we got 13 out of 17 folks have voted. So about three fourths of the folks. I'll give it like five more seconds if you want to throw in your vote here at the end, and then we'll close the poll. Okay. All right. Here are the results that we got on this. Yeah. I would love to hear from the folks um, who are in that first bucket of yes, this is fine as is. Yeah, if you, if you said yes, this is fine as is, um, raise your hand and, and just, just share why, why you feel like this is a good idea. And, and again, no, no, no judgment, just curious. All right, Dan, I'm gonna get Dan the microphone. There he is. So I'm, I'm more torn than that answer specifically, but um, I think a few things stood out here that uh, are, are red flags. Uh, one being that um, accuracy is, is kind of my first question is like, how accurate is this? Um, you know, you're getting into minority report stuff of predicting the future. Um, the, the other area is bridging uh, school and home. Um, in, in is social media uh, property of the school and is using a school email address uh, kind of there. But what really struck out at me is this is a good idea in general and, and is a fine path to, to go down. Um, just this is number one, it's using AI. So it's not necessarily a human reading all of this content, um, which is a very good uh, privacy method. Um, and then number two, um, being able to um, just have a, a prediction doesn't necessi necessarily push you in one direction or another on what to do with that prediction. Mm -hmm. So it's separating um, the action. So it depends on who is using this content. Like, is this just giving it back to the parents and suggesting to the parents, hey, talk to your kids because this instance came up? 
or is this specifically going to a government entity, uh, which is very different because they're legally allowed to put people in jail. So there are, mm -hmm. there are some fine lines on what they do with that data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this one is all about, you know, the guardrails of, of the youth. Right. And then I think this one is really clear cut because we can imagine, I mean, we, in the previous one, we could imagine the benefit as well, but here we can imagine the, the, the prevention. And so some of the false positives, if they're handled in a highly sensitive and ethical way can be, you know, we, we can tolerate the false positives here. Um, if we're preventing, you know, a school shooting, for example, um, so, yeah, so I think a lot of what you're saying resonates in terms of, like, how it's used. I guess the, the very tricky part of this is how, how do you put those guardrails on, on its use, um, you know, especially through the process of scaling, and will the, will the people on the other side of having this information of, be available be able to walk those five lines? Um, would love to hear other other folks um, comments on this one or you know additional thoughts what you struggled with Agnes yep says school therapists could use the data also the data can be anonymous and can just indicate which schools need more help in supporting students yep yeah so that yeah that gets to like maybe some opportunities kind of in that middle layer which is like what can we do in order to achieve the benefit of this, um, this solution, what can we do to make it so that we're mitigating the harms as much as possible? Um, are we, are folks up for other, um, other scenarios um, to do, go through? One more. I can go back to, I think we have time. yeah, let's do one more. Okay. One more. I think we have time for that. Um, uh, you want me to pick it? I can pick it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Which one haven't we done yet? We haven't done uh, bias. Is that correct? We haven't. We yes, haven't bias I believe we it. haven't done bias. Bias for five hundred. <laughs> and a lot of these um, seem to be kind of in this AI space. Yes. Let me get a poll going on this. Well, all right, the poll is up. It says facial recognition software misidentifies people of color. Votes are streaming in. It's funny to see them, Jeff, in the beginning because they come in so strong on one, obviously, because the first person who votes gets 100%. Right. Um, so <laughs> and then the lines begin to move, yeah, in real time. Yeah. All right, two thirds of the folks who voted in the last third, yeah, there we go, almost getting everybody now, three quarters. Um, take another 10 seconds or so to get your vote in there. Okay. All right, let's end the poll. Everybody who voted said we need to change something, either all of it or part of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to hear from the folks um, on this one of let's pivot away from the, this approach entirely. So I'd love to hear a little bit about why you ended up in that camp, obviously there's many different reasons for using, you know, for building something like this in many different ways in which you can use it. You could use it for, um, for example, for um, a security feature to unlock, you know, a property, whether it's a d digital device or, you know, physical property, you can use it for law enforcement. Um, there's a, there's a lot of different use cases, but I'm curious, um, you know, anybody chime in on, on why you voted that, the way that you did or what you struggled with, but I'm curious about the folks who specifically thought a hard no or let's like really move away from this uh, or, or rethink the approach. 
Yeah, why'd you vote that way? Um, raise your hand and I will unmute you. Mm -hmm. I didn't vote, but <laughs> I <laughs> promise. Okay. All right, leave. Kenneth, let me allow. All right, Kenneth, you're up. Hey, um, yeah, sorry, I don't mean to dominate the conversation, so I'll be quick. Um, I mean, the good news is this is kind of already shifting, right? There's there's already significant yeah. backlash against facial recognition in the public sphere, at least, particularly in the US, but also across Europe. Um, you're right that, you know, there, there's facial recognition and there's facial recognition, and there's some that I can use that benefits me, that authenticates me with my handset, for example. And there's some that is used against me by force without any possibility of consent on my behalf, other than staying out of that public space, such as, you know, in the public realm, such as in policing, even military uh, applications. Um, and I think there's a general growing uh, concern about the latter use case that's leading to protests and leading to regulation against it. So I think there's really interesting momentum that's going to, continue and I think from an ethical point of view that that's pretty cool I'm, I'm happy with that outcome mm -hmm. yeah and I, I think um, oh two more participants I'd love to hear they raise their hand Jeff I'd love to hear from them Melissa thank you um, one of the issues I see with this is a system problem in tech as an industry that we have already seen so many instances of the training data having white leaning bias. And until we actually have more appropriate, appropriate diverse representation in tech as an industry, I don't know how we can reasonably expect to overcome the flaws fast enough to prevent these kinds of issues. Tech wants to move fast. Right, and so the so there's this bias toward we'll keep going. Don't fix the data. The data takes years. It does take years to fix. It takes a tremendous amount of effort to fix that data. Um, and I just, mm -hmm. the longer tech is is substantially white, um, the longer we're going to put those issues down and deprioritize them in favor of speed. Um, and then we have all this harm continuing to happen. So, I think that for me mm -hmm. um, overtakes. Um, any kind of value and I think we've already talked about how much risk for harm there is and I just don't it doesn't it doesn't net out for me yeah thank you for sharing that um, and and I think this is some of what led Amazon you know in the last um, two weeks or month or so to put a six-month moratorium on on this facial recognition facial recognition software was there one more one more uh, raised hand? I don't think so. I think I think that 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 was it. And so, so Pavani, we're, we're running a little tight on time. And so, I want to ask you one more question, and then we'll we'll wrap this up. Um, a lot of stuff in here. We didn't get to all of it, obviously, but there's a lot of things in here. Um, what do you suggest to people who would like to take action on this but don't know how to get started on their own or with their colleagues? Like, what's what are some good next steps for folks who want to who want to deal with some of this stuff? Yeah, I think um, so. As you can see, so the point of the of this um, this game was um, to give us some practice in talking about um, you know ethical decision making and to get us talking about different scenarios and how they compare to each other to really imagine that we're part of a the same product development team. But I think what I was trying to do um, with this and believe, fundamentally believe that we should be doing as um, folks who work in product development is to be pursuing this, um, not only from an issue level, but from a process level so that we can start to think through um, from the beginning all the way to the end, you know, what we need to consider in order to make uh, more ethical products. And so I just wanted to show this, um, you know, this really quickly, which is basically a layout of the of the book um, and the 20 techniques um, and how they fall out. Uh, because what I tried to do was offer techniques that product teams can just wake up and apply tomorrow um, in order to, you know, to improve kind of the ethical bar 
that they're trying to meet and that they're meeting. And in doing so, um, the, the goal is not to necessarily add a lot of cost to the process, not necessarily have teams have to, you know, fundamentally redo their whole product, but to move to move towards a space where um, they are making more ethical decisions that are in um, in alignment with a stated code of ethics and a, and a mission so that we can kind of all move forward, um, especially in spaces where there isn't um, regulation or the regulation hasn't caught up to the pace of technology, which is usually the case with regulation. And so um, that is my hope, and um, that's, so my hope is that folks will pick up the book, you know, tactically, and start to think about how to have these conversations. Um, and I think one thing that I found was, I think it's very hard for um, individuals to kind of start these conversations because you don't want to accuse one another or your senior leaders of being unethical or not thinking things through. And so approaching it a little bit more on a process level of how did we get here? Is this in alignment with what we really want to do? Um, how can we work our way backwards and, you know, think through how we want to improve things um, is a good approach to take. Yep. Awesome. Thank you for that. Now, look, we're, we got to wrap this up because we're running out of time. And so uh, what, one thing we definitely want to do is, uh, is give away a copy of the book. So if you've, if you've hung around uh, till the end, which is awesome, um, you can uh, uh, potentially win a copy of the book from Pavanis. You have to email ethicalproductdevelopment at gmail.com, send an email there, and uh, let Pavanis know that you'd like a, a copy of her book. She will choose a winner at random and send you one. Um, she's also going to be hosting a, a series of live virtual book club discussions for groups or for colleagues over the course of the rest of the year so that you and your teams can begin a dialogue about ethical product development if it's something that you're not already talking about. So if you're interested in that, mention that in your email to Pavani that you'd like to arrange a private book club for your team, and I'm sure she'll be happy to do that for you. Beyond that, um, I, I'll say a quick thanks, Pavani, for uh, what I thought was a really fun game. Uh, I think it's like this is an interesting topic, and to put it into this kind of format makes it interesting um, and, and engaging. So thank you for, for uh, doing that and making it fun. I had, I had a good time and uh, I, I learned a ton. You bet, thank you. And thank you all of you um, for coming today and for um, putting yourself out there and sharing some of your thoughts about um, how to do this process better. So thank you, I really appreciate it. Awesome, thanks folks very much. And uh, we'll see you all next time. This will be posted. This is recorded. We'll be up live on the Sense and Respond Press YouTube channel very, very shortly. And we'll see you all next time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye.